Hey, welcome everyone to the ARCHICAD User Monthly Webinar for March 2024. My name is Eric Bobro, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today and help you with ARCHICAD questions. Um, let me know that you can hear me and see the screen, and we shall get going. Um, you can type into the GoToWebinar chat area. Uh, let me know where you're calling in from as well. and. Uh, and if you have a question that I can help you with, uh, it'd be my pleasure to do that. Um, I'll also be monitoring the Slack workspace for our KeyCAD coaching program for those of you who might be in my coaching program. Um, so if there's any of you who have questions, I can uh, take those as well. So uh, I see Ian from Scotland, Patrick, Seattle, Rich from Newcastle down under, Australia and Rick from Virginia. Okay, so Rick, you did send in a question about locking staggering columns. Okay, we'll definitely take a look at that. Um, so we have a small group so far today, 26 people is what it says, 25. Um, sure, we'll get a few more filing into the room, but let's start out with Rick, your question. I'm going to open up your microphone here. Um, so, Rick, your line is open, and I saw, let's see, I saw that question um, did come in. thought I saw it here. Maybe it went into my personal email. Let me Yesterday. just, uh, um, yeah, just scroll down if it's possibly, no, it's not there. So, let me see. Um, I did see something in email. How are you doing today? Oh, good. Like your hat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's see if I do a search. There it is. Okay. So you're seeing my screen, I believe. Is that right? Yep. Um, okay. So you have something here when I click on it it opens up in a little video clip and, and uh, thanks to you for introducing me to loom I use it all the time excellent excellent okay Eric, uh, how are you I've got a problem that's driving me a little bit nuts uh, the column line staggering I can't get it to stop and if I go to the, the source view I can unstagger it and move it over Right. It doesn't stay like that. Interesting. I okay. thought maybe if I saved it in the, in the view, then that would change it, would save it. When I go back here and it updates. Okay. Are you, by the way, are you guys um, hearing, um, are you guys hearing the, the audio from this? I am. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So I, I didn't know whether, you know, playing back on my computer, whether it was coming through. All right, so I can see the issue. I don't. I've never seen this before. Um, probably would be helpful to get a copy of the file. Is that something that you can send over to me? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so send it to you know support at Um and you can send if it's a you know a decent sized file, which I imagine this is. It looks like a substantial project. Then uh, you can send it as a link through Dropbox uh, or WeTransfer. Um, all right. Sorry, what was that? I use WeTransfer. Transfer. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so I'll leave your line open so you can let me know when it's ready to pick up and we can chat a little bit more. Has this happened on any other project? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. All right, so just this one. Um, so while we're waiting for you to get that file to me. Let me just uh, look. What version of ARCHICAD are you in? 27. Okay, all right. So I have no idea if there's anything unusual about 27, but let's just take a look at how a grid lines work just in general um, and uh, see some of the things, because not everybody really knows some of the functionality of grid lines. So I'm just gonna draw um, an arbitrary shape here. Um, 
All right, so I've got a, a shape there. Now, in terms of grid lines, you can put a regular grid like every 12 feet or something like that, or you can do individual ones. So this is the grid element tool. Um, you can name them, you know, just uh, starting with um, uh, A or 1, um, et cetera. You can have different systems, with, you know, numeric or uh, capital letters. But I'll just do the A one here, and I'll say I want to do it along here. Um, and one going this way, and one doing here, and one here. Um, now, this one that I've just put in, I'm going to stretch it um, down. Let's see, I should be able to stretch this. Okay, that's the stagger. This is the one. Let's see, we should be able to stretch that. Why are we, we have this, I can reposition this. This allows me to move it left or right. It should allow me to stretch it. Why is it not being stretchy here? Um, yeah, it's only allowing me to drag the whole thing. Um, that's a mystery because it should be stretchable if I say edit, reshape, stretch. Now it's not doing that. So let me just um, uh, take this one, delete it. We'll put in another one. I'll just say I want to make it in line with this. So hover over that. And then I'll hover over this and say that I want to start it at this intersection here. And we'll take it down to, um, well, some arbitrary point. Now, these uh, grid elements will be seen when I open up a section or an elevation um, that has this. So you can see this was a section cutting through it. We're not seeing where the, what the grid lines refer to. If I go instead to the um, elevation marker, um, so uh, here, then you can see that the grid lines are in line with where I, I sort of bent the, the building there. Now, um, when we have um, the, the grid in an elevation or a section, we can certainly move this down here. So this is, the there are two editable hotspots here. Uh, one has to do with the end of the straight segment. The other has to do with whether this is um, staggered or not. Now, as long as I keep it straight, it's sort of much the same. But if I pull this to the side, then you can see what it's doing here. Now, it um, you're you're saying that uh, your grid, and by the way, this does not affect the floor plan. The floor plan is based on where this is in space here. So this um, this uh, grid here did not bend or move just because in the elevation I did it now look at that the elevation is snapping back into a straight one for you it was a segment remember I had that um, over the side let me just put it over here go back to the floor plan go back here and it snaps straight so what is going on with this segment so we have general staggering so there's a stagger distance here I guess that's probably the distance from here to there and if I were to put in a standard length, you know, like five feet, then you can see how this um, adjusts. Now, it doesn't have a side to side thing. Um, this determines whether you're going to have a marker at top or bottom or both. And this only affects the section view of it. Um, so I'm not seeing there's a segment length. OK, so this is if it's going to be in um, segmented. Um, or is it going to be going through the whole thing? So right now you can see how each of these sort of stops and starts. If I um, make this straight, you can see how, or if I change the settings. That's interesting. This is, it's indicating that it's a segment length um, or that it's continuous, and yet it became segmented. If I go to this one, where we have the segment length, now it's going more continuous um, there. And this here, 
No, that's the continuous one. Okay, I'm misreading it. This is the continuous one. This is segments at the ends, and this is um, had the entire grid line in on the section or elevation. Interesting. Okay. Um, so the entire grid line there. Okay. Um, so I haven't played around with this for a while, but these are the controls that I know are there. And the question is, is there some other setting in the section that also is causing this to move? For me, move back to straight, and for you, to go back to the segmented thing. So I'm going to go and look at the sec uh, elevation setting, so either the section or the elevation settings, because there's control for the grid tool here. And when I go to the grid tool inside here, it says, first of all, do we want to show grid elements, period? You can turn that off and say, well, even though there are grid elements that could be shown, I don't want to show them. Um, you might do that for a presentation style where you just don't want to show grids. Now, you can also say, am I going to show it for all stories or just the ones that are on the ground floor or a certain story? Um, show grid elements by name. You can say show all of them or just certain ones, you know, like C and D. So if I do that, and you can see it's only showing C and D and not these um, other ones. Um, so you can control that, and that's something that often I've seen people, you know, not realize that this was a control. Now here's auto stagger grid markers if they overlap. I'm thinking that that might be what's draw what's pushing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is doing some automatic cleanup or whatever based on some graphic choice. So um, let me just uh, turn these back on here. Let me go and um, select this one and, you know, we'll stagger it here. Um, now, if I just refresh, rebuild from model, you can see it went back. So it sort of said, I don't need that. Now, let me change the setting for uh, the elevation, which is just this particular marker, this particular viewpoint. And I'll say, turn that off. Hey, don't do an auto, auto stagger. I will control it manually. Now it says, oh, you moved it to here. I won't automatically stagger it. And of course, if I re refresh, rebuild, um, it's not going to do that. So I think that's what your issue is. is yeah, just uh, a file, and that's perfect. That, that solved the problem. I knew you were going to do it. Yeah. So that um, auto stagger is trying to be helpful. And of course, in some ways or many times it can be, but in this case, you know, it was causing something that you that you didn't um, didn't appreciate. Um, file with a Dropbox link if you want it, but I think uh, I think we solved the problem already. All right, you like that? Okay. So, um, there any other questions for you, Rick? Um, no, I'm figuring stuff out. I've been doing this now for four years in Archicad, and I had a project architect that was doing a lot of work for me. A year ago, it's all just me. Uh, so I'm, I'm, having, I'm having fun. I'm learning things that were impossible before, like stairs and railings, but I've got it pretty good now. Okay. Well, thanks for sending in this question, and I'm happy to answer anything else that comes to mind, you know, since... Uh, we have a relatively small group that says we have about 40 people in <clears throat> um, and not many questions were sent in ahead of time. So likely any of you who have a question uh, be able to help. So I'm looking at um, some other people just saying hello, you know, com coming in or the audio is good. So Durval says, what's the difference between rebuild and rebuild from model? So let me open up Durval, your line. Okay, Durval, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good, nice. Good. Where are you calling in from? From Brazil, São Paulo. Okay, well, glad to connect with you. So, <clears throat> what's the difference between rebuild and rebuild from model? So, I believe rebuild from model would be a more thorough analysis of what should be seen in, in this case, a section or an elevation. Um, so it's going to analyze that based on uh, layers and all sorts of other things. Now, rebuild might have to do with 2D stuff that somehow um, needs to be refreshed when you move things. Sometimes 
um, on occasion, you may have something that uh, just doesn't update when you zoom in or out or, or pan around. So while I, don't, I can't say specifically the differences, I think this is a, a quicker thing and the rebuild from model is more um, extensive. Now, if we go to a um, section, I'm sorry, not a section, a detail, it's a, that is quite different. Um, and it may also have to do with right now, these elevations and sections are live. So what that means is that we have um, the, uh, where is it? Status auto rebuild model. This is saying every time, actually this is probably what it has to do with. Uh, so we have three different states for elevations and sections and we have um, uh, a different condition for details. So what does this mean? Auto rebuild model is what we would generally use for sections and elevations because every time you do something on the plan or in another view and you just bring this back up, it will rebuild it. It'll make sure it's accurate to the current model. On the other hand, if you have a very complex building like a hospital with 500 rooms and a lot of stuff going on, rebuilding the model might take more than a a few seconds. It might take even minutes to rebuild the model um, in some cases. So you may say, hey, I need to go in and put some annotation on. I'm just going to be putting in some notes and some other th things on there in 2D. So don't rebuild this until I tell you to rebuild it. So then, you know, if you have it set for manual rebuild, if, if you draw some stuff on the plan or in other views, it will not take the time to figure that out. And you can bring up that section or that elevation and do some annotation without waiting so it's more efficient and then every once in a while you can say rebuild from model and then it brings it up to date so that's probably the difference is if you're in manual rebuild then rebuild from model will go ahead and and uh, uh, you know do the equivalent of an auto rebuild now if you have a, it's set for drawing which is essentially what details are uh, with a drawing, when you do that, you're saying, you know what, I'm taking a view of something and I would like you to just to draw the 2D line work and leave it alone. I'm going to handle it from here. And then you annotate it. Maybe you remove some extraneous lines, add some more details. So then you have to clean up the line work because you're putting in some more stuff that wasn't in the model, but is part of the design. Um, and so now that's a drawing. Now, when you're um, detailed drawings are pretty much always done that way. So let's say, you know, 98% of the time you'd have a detail um, that is a copy of what the model looked like at a certain point, but is not being updated automatically. Uh, so in, if you have a detailed drawing, you can say rebuild from model. Why? Maybe you didn't actually do any work on it in 2D and you just said this is going to be the eave detail and now your roof slope has changed or something else has changed so you just say hey i've told you where i want this detail to be done just rebuild it based on the current model and then of course you can annotate now if you have done some work on it you've drawn some labels and things like that some things will be static meaning they're just floating on top of the model and even if you said rebuild from model they'll just sit there the model will update and you know, you've got an updated drawing with annotation. Um, if you've gone in and deleted some line work or stretched lines or changed the attributes, making things thinner or thicker, then if you rebuild from model, then those changes would disappear because it's going to put a version of the graphics from the model. So anyway, that's that's some um, explanations of two different contexts for rebuild from model. Um, one being for a manual rebuild or drawing version of a section or an elevation, and the other being for um, a detailed drawing. So, Derval, does that make it clear? Yes, thank you very much. Any any uh, follow-up questions? No, not for now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks for asking the question, giving me something constructive to talk about. All right, so Patrick, hey, can you in a 3D model review the sliders that cut through the model in the vertical and horizontal? Sure, we can do that. 
and I see Kai or Cake, I guess probably Kai from Hawaii. He says, if you run out of questions, I'd love a basic review of using zones and also creating schedules, windows and doors, and you're on 25. Okay, cool. Well, let's take Patrick's question. Let me just see. There were a few questions sent in. And what I want to do is, of course, anyone who did send them in ahead of time, <clears throat> give priority if they're on the call. <clears throat> um, and uh, don't see here. No. Um, I wonder if Larry Hallinan is on the call. No, don't see him. Um, yeah, I think, and Leaf is not on the call. Um, okay, so, yeah, I don't see actually any other ones um, here. But if you did send it in, please type it into the chat area. Let me also bring up my Slack thing and see. All right, nobody's typed in there. Okay, so then, oh, and let me look up my email because there were also a handful of things. Here's Rick's question about the column grid. Um, and so let's see. Um, I thought there was another one. Let me just double check in case anyone else sent in a question that I want to do lots and lots of emails, but um, so yeah, I get a lot of emails. Um, okay, I don't see that. All right, so if you um, okay, that's a that's a billing issue there. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> Let me go to then next question that I'm at least seeing is Patrick. So Patrick, Paul, let's open up your line. Patrick, your line is open. Patrick, are you, uh, do you have a microphone? Um, and I see Rick Matthews uh, run through more features. Okay, we can certainly spend some time on that. Uh, yeah. There you go, Patrick. Yeah, I unmuted my mic. Uh, you know, in the 3D model, you can you can come down from the top and kind of dissolve the model so you can see the interior, or you can come from the side and mm -hmm. and you know cut through the model. I just wanted you if you could review how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So in order to give it something a little bit more interesting than just this empty box, what I'll do is open up sample project um, for master template um, let's see sample project USA here okay and I'll launch a new instance all right um, so that's uh, many of you well, have seen this more than you care to because I have used it over the years uh, but it's basically a little residential project that has a little of this a little of that a little of the third thing and just a lot of things that I can demonstrate easily because you know I'm showing framing here and I'm showing foundations there and I'm showing detail drawings and things. It's not intended to be a fancy high design project, but it shows a lot of how ARCHICAD can be used. Um, so in this case, I'll use it as a way of demonstrating this um, the sliders. So first of all, the uh, concept here, let me just go in and open up um, 3D view um, here. Concept is that we can do a cutaway. Now there's two ways to do cutaways, sort of generically in ARCHICAD. One is that I can do a marquee, either rectangular or an irregular shape, like using the marquee like this. And so I can have some arbitrary shape. And then I can say, I'd like to show the marquee in 3D. And we'll see that this is, you know, showing that rather arbitrary cut through. Right now it's not showing the um, all the layers because I went back to the plan, but I could say, let's put it on the building in sight. And now we've got this cut 
you know, in that rather arbitrary way. Um, now, let me just say um, uh, show all instead of show just what was in the marquee. And let's look at how we can do a cutaway that's a different style. So that's done using the view menu, elements in 3D view, filter and cut. I'm sorry, it's, it's a 3D cutaway. So 3D cutaway, which has a shortcut of command or control Y, which is the last letter of cutaway, if you think about it. When I turn that on, it doesn't instantly cut anything, but it does add these little scissor icons to the sides of the view. And if I press down on the scissor icon and drag it, you'll see I'm actually now positioning a cutting plane. Now it, it says um, that, uh, if I move this away a little bit, it says finalize or cancel. Um, so I can say finalize this. So now I can move around and you can see that mm. cutting plane is visible. Now all of this is live I and mean, these are real elements and I can edit them. And even though this is cut, I can see where it extends to, but I'm not seeing the roof up above um, up above there. Um, so it is a way, whoops, it is a way that I can, um, you know, visualize things, show a client, just study, you know, what's going on, you know, in this corner, when I cut, a, cut, cut this away, you can see um, how detailed things can be there. Now I did that using the cutaway from the top. I can also use one from the side and you can see how it's going to come in you know, at a certain place, and I say finalize it. Um, now, I can actually move this after the fact. It's still visible, and I can move it in or out. You know, let's say move it to the back part, and again, finalize it. So it's not final, final, and I can always say um, show all, and then it's going to um, actually, no, it won't. In order to turn off the cutaways, I need to go to the view menu and turn off 3D cutaway or just hit command Y. So if I hit command Y, see it goes away. If I hit command Y again, it remembers that cutaway. And you can have multiple cutting ones. I did one from the top, one from the side, but you can actually have them from several sides. Um, now I can go to any one of these little cutting things and right click and say delete all cutting planes. That will get rid of the current ones, and then I can sort of start fresh. Um, I can also go and just hover over one of them and say I'd like to delete that cutting plane or do something else. Now this is an option here to say reverse cutting plane direction. Now if I do that, you'll see it will allow me to see the top part and remove the bottom. You know, obviously not too much to see there. Let me just reverse it. Let me reverse it back and do reverse on this one, which would be a little bit more interesting. Um, so reverse this one. And now, you know, I'm looking at the other side. Okay, um, there. Now the cutting plane doesn't have to be from one of these uh, um, directions, which are sort of on the axes. Um, if I do have an angle piece, and I don't know that I have one um, uh, here, but uh, I think you can do it on an arbitrary thing, but let, let's just, to make it simple, let me just delete all cutting planes. We're starting fresh. Um, and let me, um, actually we can do a cutting plane, let's say parallel to, you know, something a roof. That would be an interesting um, one and sort of cut in from the roof. So if I press down on this um, and say, uh, create custom cutting plane. Oh. Then you can see there's a, a prompt that says enter a point, a linear edge, or a surface for the cutting plane. That's in the bottom left here. So if I go on this surface, um, you, you can see how this is changing direction. And I'm oh. not quite not quite clear. Yeah, I guess it is matching that surface there. I click on this, and then I can take it in. You can see I'm cutting in to that on an angle. You can see the angle. Yeah, that's that crazy. 
Um, so, and of course, I, I don't like that. Let me just delete that cutting plane. Um, you can also rotate the cutting plane, which you know might be a little weird, but you can say, let me take it around this angle and let's um, let's rotate it down to here. Um, you know, so you can do things. I mean, I'm obviously not making a whole lot of sense, but the um, ultimately what um, this allows you to do is to study the building on the fly, move, you know, looking at how things fit. So probably the favorite one that I would say is, you know, you're just saying you want to do one, maybe not that one. Let's say um, place cutting plane. How do I do this? I'm going to hit the trash thing. I don't really want that one. Let's see if I right click and say create custom cutting plane and do it based on this wall. And now, oh, it's interesting. It's rotating it. Um, or maybe I just have to um, snap to that wall. Um, now, let's see if I take this cutting plane in. So you can then sort of look at what's going on and mm -hmm you know, move in and say, what's going on with the cabinet? What's going on with this cabinet? What's going on, you know, when we get into the wall and we're looking at the, the stair? You know, it's a very interesting sort of study that you can do. And it, it's non-destructive. And of course, we can just cancel out of this and we can delete the cutting planes to go back to, um, to uh, delete all cutting planes. Now we're back to a full thing. And then ultimately, um, if you just don't want to see these little extra things, you're not doing that. You just use the, um, uh, okay. And then there's one other thing, actually, you can show or hide the cutting plane. So let's say that I have, um, uh, if I take this cutting plane down, so I'm cutting off the top like I did here, finalize it. Well, it, it sort of is getting in the way. This is actually, uh, um, I'm clicking on it. It's getting in the way. I could say, let's see, I could right click on this and say, don't show them, they're still active, but you can see the, the line work disappears. And now, you know, as I move around, there's nothing to click on and, you know, get in the way. And you can see this little eyeball. So if I go here and say show cutting planes, now I can see that um, there. So that's sort of the 10 minute explanation of how cutting planes can work. Uh, the one last thing I'll say is that you can save any of these views. So let's say that this is a view that's interesting because you're cutting through the top of the second floor and you're looking in a 3D view. I can go to my view map here and say that I'd like to um, save the current view and give it a name, you know, um, uh, second floor cutaway um, AXO um, here. And then let me go down and take this down to the lower section um, and finalize it for at least for the moment. And then say, I want to say this one and say um, ground floor um, cut, cut away XO here. So these are now two views that show up somewhere in my view map. I can move them around. But now if I double click on this one, you see how it goes back. Double click on this one here. And you can be zoomed in on this. Well, actually, I guess if you're zoomed in, it'll it'll go back out to the zoom that it was. But um, this is certainly live. It's not a picture. It's looking at the model with certain, you know, um, cutaway activated. So is that pretty clear? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see if anyone else has um, questions about it. Uh, other a couple other random comments. Once we've saved the view, we can drop it onto a um, sheet. So in fact, I think on the sheets, I have some um, uh, some ones that are um, presentation here. Um, you know, so here, <clears throat> here's an interesting um, one from this project where there are two views. Remember how I cut off the top? And I say, well, it's not too much, not, or, you know, I, I cut off the top. That was interesting. But then I also could cut off the bottom. And as well, there's not too much that's very interesting about that. But think about this. You can save that view. 
just from the same angle, you know, not rotating it around to get underneath it, and then put these two views together. This is one view, this is another view, and the line work is purely 2D, just <clears throat> to show the connections. Um, and you can see another version here <clears throat> where we have this with line work as opposed to a shaded view. So that's another thing. You just basically save <clears throat> save the view um, like I did and then place that view. And of course, you have to line it up. You know, So in fact, initially, I probably put this point right on top of that point, And then I just dragged it straight up to you know the visually pleasing distance any uh follow-up questions patrick no that's great thank you eric you're welcome all right so kai um if you run out of questions love a basic review of using zones and also creating schedules and then rich matthew saying running through more features yeah um, and Heather says, I'm not able to speak, but I was wondering if you could tell us how useful AI visualization is, and is this something that will be beneficial, harmful, or innocuous to the architectural industry? Okay, what a interesting sort of challenging question. Um, I'll speak to that, uh, but let me hold on and do it in the order uh, that these questions have come in. So Kai, let me open up your line. Here. Okay, so Kai, your line, your microphone is open. Hi, no, I'm just, um, I never used the uh, zone tools mm -hmm. in, and I've never done automatic scheduling and I understand they're kind of related and okay. I've always just taken my time and done them, you know, manually and made changes manually, but it seems like a powerful thing I should be doing after all these years of RT. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, let me let me give you, you know, a sort of quick intro to the zone tool, how you use it and and what it's good for. Um, and then how it relates to schedules, which it can relate to schedules, although in general I'd say most schedules don't use zones because you just say here's a list of all the windows or all the doors. But when you want to do uh, an inventory, like in a commercial project, you say, give me a list of all the equipment or the furniture in each of the offices, you know, that can be very useful because each office can be a zone and each object in that office can say, oh, I'm in a zone here. I'm a so There's a zone that's associated with this area. And so you can list things. Um, so, uh, but let's just first look at zones. So we can see here that there's some labels saying that it's a kitchen. Uh, now this is pure text because in the floor plan, I just want to be able to label this saying what the room name is. But if I go to one of the save views in the, in the sample project that I've got for master template um, and I go to room finish plans, um, we'll see that uh, we have a different look we've got like tiles on the kitchen floor we have the name kitchen with some information you know that it's 108 square feet or the sleeping room here um so this is a showing thing now uh, maybe um space planning zones this is uh another view um which shows some color coding um and you can see sort of a stipple for um, this one, which would be carpeted, and this one would be parquet, and this one would be tile, things like that. All right, so what's going on here? When I um, hover over this and click, um, as we should, um, what am I seeing here? That's the slab, that's the zone. Okay, so in this case, you can see I've selected something with handles in the center. That's called the zone stamp. And then you can see the handles on the outside that indicate the actual shape of the room, you know, going out to the corners um, here. So this particular zone is um, searching for the boundaries of the area. So it, it basically, it can be placed automatically and it can be updated automatically 
So if we made this wall bigger, you know, push it off to the side, the zone would get bigger. It would report a different area um, for that. Um, now you can also place zones manually and saying click, 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 click for, you know, a, a rectangular shape, click, click to say from here to there. Um, that's another option. And in some cases that's very helpful because you may not have walls surrounding a whole area. Uh, there is an option when you're saying search for the walls uh, to look for these walls, but you notice that there is no wall along here. So it's actually using a line. There'll be a line that's currently not very prominent that is indicating the boundary. And that line is being designated as a zone boundary. So walls naturally play a role as a zone boundary, but you can also say, well, I'm going to divide between the living and the dining room or between the lobby and the hallway with this line that's sort of arbitrary in space, it might mean that that's the edge of where tile changes to carpet or something else, but it also just may mean we're gonna call this the lobby and we're gonna call that the beginning of the hallway um, in terms of zones. So let's just look at um, how zones work if I go to the blank project here that I had. Um, so uh, I'll just do a couple of uh, walls um, in here, like this, um, and uh, another one here. Okay, so I haven't put in any doors, uh, and in fact, I didn't actually connect this properly. There we go. Um, and I'm not worrying about the wall types right now. These, you know, this is a, a single, uh, like it's got cladding or something on one side, not on both. But for purposes of just demonstration, I've marked out the area. When I go to the zone tool, um, so the zone tool is this one, and I say, hey, I would like to look at the boundaries automatically, and I'm going to put in a zone, and I can give it a name after the fact or before um, the fact. Let's just call it um, room one here. And I can then click, and you can see when I click, a single click, it says, okay, I got something. I can't really tell what it's doing, but it's got this little hammer icon, which you'll also see when you do um, dimensions. It's saying, where do you want this place? Well, what is it placing? It's placing the zone stamp. Now I'm gonna click, and you can see that on that second click, it put in something called room one, it's actually showing twice because it, this I've got the Graphisoft standard template for US open and the default settings for zones are funky. Why did they do that? Why didn't they have it set up so when you just click a zone, it would look okay? Well, let's fix the problem. I'm gonna select this zone here. You're gonna go in to the settings and say, what does the um, stamp look like? Well, it says, we're gonna put the name of it, which is this room one, if I were to call it room um, uh, room 10, we'll see that changing it here changes it on the plan, right? But then we're also gonna have some things down below. Um, let's see, it would be under settings here probably. It says, okay, are we doing uniform display regardless of whether we're at quarter inch or eighth inch or different scales? Okay, but what is the content of it? And it says it's gonna put the zone name and the zone number. Now we already had the zone name showing, so it's putting in the zone name twice. So what I'm gonna do is say remove that and just have the number say okay. And now we can see it says room 10, which is remember what I changed, and it has the 001, which probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but basically you can have names like this is, um, you know, uh, 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 production, you know, give it that as the name of the office. And then this is the office number, you know, 212 or something like that. Um, so you can have a name and you can have a number. And of course, you don't have to show this below that but it's, a, it's available as an identifier. All right, so now I've cleaned it up 
saying we probably don't want to show the root the zone name twice not once big and once small um, but that's fine now I'm going to go and I drop this with you know whoops um, I'm going to hold down the I, I drop key hover over this and click so now the default for this is here and I'll say we're going to put this something else we're going to say this um, uh, staff meeting Um, okay, and we'll give this a different number, you know, 215 here, and then I'll click in here, click twice. And now, you know, now that I've cleaned up the setting, it looks much more reasonable. Now, there's other settings that'll say what size font this is, what type of font it is, etc. But that's the basics of placing a zone when you have a bounded area. Now, let's say that I wanted to have this area done and stop it here, because this is gonna be a different sort of function. Well, I can go and say, I'm placing a zone. I won't worry about the name of it. I'll just say, I'm gonna place the zone from here to here and place the staff there. And again, it's a staff meeting. Now that's fine, that's manually placed. When I select it, we can see you know these, these handles there. But if I wanted it to um, sort of, uh, things to behave in a certain way, I might want to put a line here indicating that this is a demarcation and select the line. And one of the options in the line is, is it the will it function as a zone boundary? And that checkbox, which was set as the default, makes it so. So now if I go back to the zone tool and I say, just um, don't do it manually, look for a boundary. Now, when I click here, you can see it finds that one and it's going to find this one. And of course, you know, this would be, you know, something else, big room. Okay, so that's a few things. Now, when I selected it, it changed color to indicate that it was selected. But if I really want to make these color coded, I can say, well, what type of space is it? Um, it is, um, uh, let's see, I don't know. Is it institutional? The, the, these zone names are sort of odd to me. I don't know. Um, uh, I'll just call it business. All right. Um, so you can have different zone categories. These are defined under options. Um, where is it? Uh, options. Uh, why am I not seeing this? Um, Where is zone categories? Um, zone categories, right here. Okay, so zone categories, and you can define a list here. You can create new ones, and each one of them will have a color, and that allows you to do, you know, color-coded um, uh, drawings, you know, where you have certain ones that look one color, certain ones that look another color. So, Kai, how, how are you following this so far? I am, thank you. Um, something I, I'd like to, yeah, set up and customize for my own template, and it'll be easy to plug and play as, for all my projects. Right. So certainly, when you um, want to say, well, the, the categories that I care about are this, you know, and then you say storage and bedrooms and you know, living room and kitchen and whatever you can do that. Or if you're doing commercial projects, you know, office, uh, public space, you know, utility, you know, whatever things. Um, so you can create those categories, give them colors, and set up some defaults. And now, without getting into all sorts of complexity, the stamp right now looks a certain way, but you can have stamps that have much more detail, like, for example, room finishes. Um, you can have it show the square footage or the area. Um, and uh, you know there are different stamps. So just like you have different objects, you have this type of chair and that type of chair and a third type of chair. You have zone stamps that can have different functionality. Um, so this is sort of just the beginning of learning how you can mark out an area and get color coded and and text annotated um, information. Now, other things that I think we could come back to, but I don't want to spend, try to do a, 
and exhaustive training on zones is that you can schedule a zone. So you can say, here's a list of all the offices or all the rooms in this project or all the suites, you know, in, in a, you know, like a hotel or something like that. So you can have lists like that that are in a tabular form, like a schedule. Now, schedules, you asked about that, and that is, again, you know, very rich, complex thing. So let me go back to the other project and just say, well, um, let's look at a furniture plan um, here. Okay, so here's a, you know, some furniture. Now, what what would we schedule in a project? Well, usually we schedule a window schedule, door schedule. Sometimes we'll have furniture or we'll have equipment schedule or, you know, other things. <clears throat> um, so all sorts of things in ARCHICAD can be scheduled. It typically is saying, give me a list of certain things and here's the information I want to see. So where do you see that? Well, first of all, in the project map, schedules exist um, under the schedule area. And there are two different types of listing generically. There's schedules, which have to do with things in the project. And then there are indexes, which have to do with drawings or sheets in the documentation set. So they're both listing things and they have a lot of similarities, but schedules are gonna be what you do for doors, windows, furniture, at, uh, or even zones. Now, schedules are divided into elements, components, and surfaces. Most of the time, people use the element schedules. So the element schedule can give you areas, can give you door types or door schedules. You know, so these are things, right? Those are elements. You also can have components where you say, I want to list how much brick, how much concrete, how much drywall, etc. And <clears throat> with some careful setup, you can have it total up all the interior walls, the drywall on both sides, and then the exterior walls, the drywall is only on the inside, and this is how much drywall we're going to need. Um, so that's another thing you can do. And then there's uh, something called surfaces where you can get a finished schedule and you can say, well, what paint colors are we using or what, um, you know, how much of a certain type of finish we need. Um, now, most of the stuff that I work with with people has to do with uh, element schedules. So, for example, if I look at um, door schedule here, here's a list of the doors in this project with sizes, and there can be some notes in there. And, of course, it can be more complicated. This one's a, a door schedule simple. Here's one that's much more, um, let's see, uh, a little bit more elaborate with um, sizes including thickness and and some places where you could have uh, details uh, referred to um, here um, you know hardware notes etc so each of these is a door on the plan and i can select it here and say show me that door and there's that door door one okay whatever information i put into the door um, in the um, I guess it's under uh, description here. This information can be seen in a schedule. So uh, I'm not sure whether this is set up, but let's just say header detail. I have header detail 12 or something like that. Okay. So that's just a text that I put in. Now, if we go back to that schedule, there's the 12. So if I go in here and I say the jam detail is 26 or something like that, um, then if I go back to the, uh, to the element and open it up, then we'll see there's the 26. So this is bi-directional. You can put stuff in, in either the element on the plan or in the schedule. And of course, they're all coordinated. And you could select multiple doors on the plan and say, well, they all have the same header detail. Um, and then that's one way of filling it in. Or you can just go into the schedule and just so this one, that one, the next one, that one, you just type or paste it in. So is that conceptual? very helpful? It looks like a very powerful thing that I should have been doing all along. And I'll, I'll spend some time and okay. uh, yeah. experiment with it and, and 
get it going for my own projects. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Welcome. Um, so last thing I'll just talk about and, and you know, briefly is so we're in a schedule here. Schedules have schemes. So a scheme defines what's listed and what's and, and what information is showing. When I click on scheme settings, it says this door frame schedule, which is designed for existing doors as opposed to new ones, is going to show element types that are all door types. That means doors and pro I believe probably doors in curtain walls that are somehow designated as a different thing, but they're, you know, we think of them as doors. Okay, and in this case, it's saying only do uh, doors that are listed as existing and only do them if they have an ID that's not a Z. So if we put in a Z for an ID, then it, it will ignore it. Um, so this is just one rule. Now, if we look at the new one here, this is similar, and it says only do it for new doors and do it as long as the hot link or the element ID is less than X. Well, X and Z, you know, it's just if, if you want to put an X saying, no, don't schedule this. This is just a cutout in the wall. It's an unframed opening or it's a framed opening, but no door. You can put an X in there, um, that sort of thing. You can also say that I want, this is for a standard one, I'll only list ones that start with a D. So, you know, this is these are just ways of saying, well, you know, in this case, I want it only doors starting with a D. What that means is you could have multiple buildings with different schedules, and in building one, you say that the, the, the schedule, you're listing only the doors that start with D1, or 1D, or 1-D, or you know something like that. So, um, so you can be selective and have different schedules for different groups. Um, and you can also say, I want to have a schedule just for the ground floor doors, and then one for the second floor and the third floor, if you have a big complex building, you might want to do that. So this is saying do doors and it's saying don't put in empty doors. So, you know, most doors, but not the ones that are using the library part called empty door. Um, and don't put in the ones that say opening because there's ones that just say rectangular opening or arch top opening. And those are not real doors, they're just cutouts, right? So this is saying certain rules. And then within here, these are the things that are going to be listed. And I don't have time to demonstrate all of the things, but you basically can say, these are the things I want to pay attention to. These are the, no, no I don't need that. And you can say, um, highlight, um, you know, the panel thickness and say, I want to remove that because I don't need that, you know, or the type. Um, so that's sort of the basics of um, how a schedule is done. If we look at something like um, the window, window schedules, it's saying, list the windows. And if I say fixtures, furniture, and equipment, we're saying that it's going to be, um, uh, in this case, only things that are part of furnishings or light fixtures or lamps here. Um, if we do something like plumbing, it's saying um, it is, uh, uh, the category for it is plumbing here. You know, So there's all sorts of things that you can set up saying, what do I want to list? And there are ways of saying it has a, an ID of a certain number, or it has some other criteria that you could say, these are the ones I want in this group. So that's um, that's some of the basics of schedules. And then the schedule you place on sheets and they are kept up to date, just like an elevation, you assume, you know, or you make sure that it's refreshed before you print so that it has the latest version of your model. Okay, so I see Kai, you wrote awesome. Thank you, you're welcome. All right, so Rich Matthews, you're up next for more features. And then I know Heather had a question about AI stuff, AI visualization. Ryan said, um, okay, um, so Ryan, let's open up your thing because you have some insightful comments here as always. Um, Ryan, here, okay, so Ryan. Hey, how's said, going? Yeah, how you doing? Good, thank you. Yeah, so, I used to work for Asa Abue a long time ago. And, you know, when you're doing a giant door schedule for a commercial project, you know, it's one thing to schedule. It's another thing to spec it. And usually that's a big deal. So they had a they have a tool for Revit where it syncs with their cloud and 
they spec it and they send it back. So I ran into them at a mixer the other day and they mentioned ARCHICAD. So I am just exploring it. You know, I don't work for the company any longer, but if I am going to get into needing that, um, it should be super helpful. Um, in the mm -hmm. past, you used to send them the door schedule. They would actually spec all, all every part and piece if you were buying it from them. And they'd send it back, which mm -hmm. is, as anybody who does a commercial project on this call knows, that's a pretty big deal. Right. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I I replied back to your question just so that other people would see it because. What happens is anything that people type in, I see it, but only if I reply back will you know you all see it. So you have a link there to um, the ASA Abloy uh, tool, um, and uh, in the right. fact that they have a lot of commercial doors that now you can use directly inside ARCHICAD and have this the spec information. Yeah. And at the bottom of that page, it may not be so obvious, but you actually have to connect with uh, one of their professionals and then they'll send you the actual link to download it. Uh, it's a little cryptic that way, but it's their way of, of connecting with you so that, you know, you know how to install it. Um, yeah, I can so here's, here's the link that you just posted yeah. there. And so I'm putting and it on. Scroll down something. to the bottom. See, it says, uh, connect with your consultant and then down at the bottom where it says contact it says contact opening studio representative you want to click that to then find your person in your area because they'll probably do it by um, country yeah let me just put in United States and then well it looks like oh, yeah and then California um, okay There's so probably I, gonna be several in California is yeah so I say different. okay and uh it just opened up a it looks like uh, it it opened yeah. up a, a um coming here so this is being directed to us region four supported oakland studio.com okay anyway so they set up some sophisticated things but bottom line if we go back here it says Welcome to this opening studio where I guess you can create your, you know, define door and window stuff. And this is for ARCHICAD. It says we'll work with certain ARCHICAD system requirements. I'm, you know, I don't know what versions it is. And if you want to install it and you're on Mac, you do this one, Windows there, analyze. So clearly it's going to do something with your project. Once you've installed it, it'll report on certain, some things and export import to ARCHICAD. So that's the actual library parts that you're um, sort of specking out. In the past, what they've done is they've actually given you the actual library part on the Revit side. It would be really kind of cool if their library would actually make it for us, you know, with the actual handle and the actual, maybe it has a, a little window in the door. Um, I haven't tested it out. If it does that, that'll be, really cool okay Some well people... just briefly it says in the door and frame schedule hover over the export so you're defining something based on some at least sizes and maybe some other settings um and then you're going to the export wizard select parameters and choose select the archicad template and export then inside archicad here we are in archicad we're using an import so opening studio appears to be um when you install their tool, it'll add another menu to your ARCHICAD environment, and then you can say yep. import, and once the import is complete, so it doesn't really show what that is, but I can assume that it's going to be a window or a door, um, uh, or maybe a set of them, um, that then you are going to see in 3D and going to have some information uh, as well as just the, the 3D and the symbol. Yeah, probably if it goes as far as the Revit platform does, it'll replace your library object. Okay, and so, so you select the library object that you've sort of done a generic version of, and it'll put in the their version in, in place of it? That's the way the Revit side works. I hope it does on ARCHICAD because that'd be pretty cool. You wouldn't have to touch the doors. You just let them do their job on the doors, kick plates all the electrified hardware you know they, you'd be surprised how much work they'll do for you 
Mm. And, you know, being an architect on the sales side, a lot of people don't realize how much work all of these different companies will do for you. And the fact that they're trying on the Archicad side is huge for us. Mm -hmm. um, door, door schedules, especially commercial door schedules, are rocket science. They're difficult. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I'm sure that some people will find that useful, either people who are on the call right now or ones who watch the recording. Yeah. All right. I've been having a lot of fun with the design options, too. I think that's probably the most powerful thing since the BIM server. Yeah, um, well, certainly it's a very powerful part of 27 and how yeah. it compares to, well, we have specialized things like, I think the stair and railing tools are amazing. They're complex and tricky in certain ways, uh, but they're amazing thing, but they are just for, for, you know, for stairs. And railings whereas design options is for anything whether it's you know your um, facade or your interior fit out or you know the whole layout of of a multi-building project um, you know you basically designate certain things as being one option and certain things as another and maybe a third or fourth option and then you can switch between them instantly plus there's all sorts of other things you can do like having a template of elements that you just sort of swap in. I want to show that now. Nope, now I want to hide it, you know. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. pretty cool. And yeah, then, right. yeah, awesome. Well, thanks for letting me inject that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Rick uh, Pratt, who was on earlier, says thanks to you, Ryan. Um, so uh, I guess he appreciated learning about the ASA Abloy stuff, so. Cool. All right, so Rick Matthews, um, or let's get your line open, Rich, here. Um, so are you, uh, there I see, I've got you in twice. One says offline, one says, oh, and there's another one. Let's see about this one. You're on three times. Hey, Rich. Yeah, I'm trying, have you got me? Yes. I do have, yeah, we are hearing you, good, all yeah. right. So um, you were talking about, uh, well, how are things going, by the way, down under? Oh, very busy at the moment, thank goodness. <laughs> I Good. guess. Good. Yeah, no, uh, no. Uh, yeah. So um, what, what um, by the way, I was just down in New Zealand, so I'm not, I wasn't in Australia, but I was relatively close. Um, so my other business, as some of you or many of you know, um, is Architect Marketing Institute. Uh, we help architects with marketing and sales and bringing in better clients. My business partner in that one is Richard Petrie. He's a New Zealander. And for the first time, my wife and I went down to New Zealand. We ran a small conference for some of our members um, down in Queenstown, which is a gorgeous part of New Zealand, a uh, beautiful lake and mountains. And, you know, so that was very special to go down there. Just got back last week and, you know, still feeling a little bit of the, you know, impact of having been away. Um, you ever spend any time in New Zealand, Rich? Yes, I have. Queenstown, well, toured a lot of the South Island, particularly a bit of the North Island. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. My mm -hmm. wife likes it because there's no snakes. Ah. When, I go fishing, when I go fishing, she can sit in the grass and wait for me to come back if I haven't drowned myself in the river. And, <laughs> but she doesn't have to worry because there's no snakes. Right. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to know. I, I guess when you're an island, uh, as opposed to a continent, then it's possible to be more, um, well, to control the environment a little bit more. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Go away, Siri. Um, all right. So uh, more features. Uh, I mean, I could start from the beginning of just how do you draw a box with a morph, but what, what sort of questions do you have? Well, it's um, uh, look. Uh, I've I've sort of avoided morphs to some degree because of some of the difficulties I've experienced trying to shape them. Um, I I just looked at one of your uh, uh, videos online the other day and and wish I'd watched a few more of those because um, that certainly would have helped me in something I just did recently. Um, I, I guess it, the, the part of the problem I you know is is sort of dealing with things like the mesh. Uh, and morphs in the same respect is where it, it can become pretty time consuming to try to shape something. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I don't know if anybody else wants to spend time looking at that, but it's, um, you know, if you're looking, for instance, sometimes it's too easy to grab the lowest point of a morph when you're looking at it in the 3D and stretching that up, you know, trying to move, shape things basically, curve the sides, whatever, um, of a morph in the in the 3D um, window. Yeah, working with morphs is tricky. I, I only occasionally play with them. So I can demonstrate the basics, and if there was something specific, I could work on it. But, you know, it's sort of the question is, do you want me just to demonstrate some basic functionality of morphs uh, that, uh, you know, maybe you just hear something like, oh, I didn't realize you could do that. Um, or do you want to me to try to create something specific? Or do you have something you want to send me and say, hey, uh, I did this. Can you do better? I and mean, just tell me what you want. Uh, look. Probably just a basic thing. I'm not sure if other people are interested. They can flag it if they are or not, but um, um, that's always a good start is to start off with the basics. There's nothing specific at the moment. Um, like I said, I did have a, I did have a, uh, well, in fact, I do have, I have a stairway that you may have demonstrated how you could put a capping so I can, I can use that to do a roof and uh, other okay. features and on send, the, send me a file with your, with your stair. Yep. We can look at that specific context, and meanwhile, I'll just demonstrate a few things about functionality of morphs and what they're good for, um, at least from my perspective. Um, so, you, can you send me that file? Yes, I will. Yes, thanks. Good. All right. So while we're working or while we're waiting for that, I'm just going to go to the morph tool. So, what what is a morph? First of all, it's a very general purpose geometry maker. It also can take something that's already exists. You can turn it into a morph, and then you can do some fine tuning of the shapes and forms. Now, it's very crude in the sense that you're dealing with just lines and surfaces. And while you can color code this part is yellow and that part is blue, they're not really separate things, and there's no parametric control like. I want to have three of these, or I want this, you know, there's just no controls like an object has, um, or like a wall where you say, I want to change, oh, maybe I'm going to add another skin to it, or I'm going to change the depth of it. You know, it's all just shapes. Okay, so that's good and, you know, limiting. All right, but let's look at the basic functionality. So with the morph tool, we can draw lines and closed lines, um, shapes, or we can draw volumes. Okay, so if I draw, let me just draw a couple of lines like this. So looks like a polyline. Let me draw this one is a box, and I'll do this here. And when I go to 3D, what we're going to see is those lines that I drew show up in 3D. Why? Because they're morphs. They're not just lines. They look like lines but they're actually 3D elements. Now, if I do um, the morph tool and, and use the option for a box like this, I'll click those two points because I chose the rectangular one. And then it says, well, how tall will it be? It defaults to one meter, three foot three. Let me just make it five feet even there. Now, it looks the same as this one, but when I go to 3D, we'll see that it's a five foot high box, right? Now, this shape here, I can extrude. So I can press down on it, and there's some manipulation tools here when you're pressing down on, when you select a morph and then you click on an edge or um, a face. And I can say, I want to move this push or pull this. So I can move this up or down. So I can make this five feet, or I can make it go up to the same height. So I could have drawn it all in one step, but I've now I've done it separately. Now I can also go here and select this, and say, oh, I want it to be lower. So I'm pushing or pulling, and I can take it down to the five feet. So, so far it's just a volumetric type thing. But now if I want to um, do something more complex, I can draw on the surface. So I can select this and then say, I want to draw on the surface, and let's say at the halfway mark here, there's a snap, and I'll draw something down. Actually, I'll draw, I use the pencil here, and say I want to draw something down, 
and then draw something across and click again. Now, <clears throat> what we can see is that I've just defined two edges. They're purely <laughs> um, lines, but they are on a plane in space. But now that I've done that, if I select this and I grab this, I can pull this out. So you can see it's smart enough to extend this all out and you know take that shape. So that gives some real possibilities. Now, if I take this in, it's smart enough to cut this out. So it's um, it's actually modifying the shapes of the adjoining things. Now, if I take um, if I wanted to pull this back so it was slanted, something like that, what I can do is instead of selecting the morph as a whole. I can switch my selection arrow tool to a sub-selection thing, um, and this only works with morphs. If I click on anything else, like the wall, it says, um, this element type does not have any selectable faces or edges. Please click on a morph. If I, um, if I click on this, it says, oh, well, there's a, an edge of a morph, and then I can go and drag this Let's see, I think I don't want to draw, I want to, um, let's see. Um, I say, no, I don't want to draw a new line. I want to move um, move this edge. Um, so here, so it's going to be a little odd, and this is where controls become you know, tricky. I'm moving this up and down along this face. Now, it's, it's done something pretty intricate there. Not necessarily what I wanted because I didn't have a fold line here, right? So let me undo that and say, all right, well, if I really want this to slope down, then I probably need to have another line across here. So I'll select this, click on the edge here and say, you know what? I don't want to move this edge. I want to draw a new line from here. Um, say draw a new line from here to there. And now, if I select this line and move it, um, let's see, depends upon the angle you're, you're at. Um, and I don't remember exactly how to get the controls, but if I take this and say I want to move, I don't want to um, draw a new line, I want to move this down. So you can see it, I'm in the move mode, but all I've got selected is that face. So now I can take this down perhaps to here. So while that was sort of painful, once you you know get into it, it's not too bad. I basically drew a fold line and then took the edge and selected it and said, move it down to here. And so we can start getting some intricate shapes. You can also do some rounding um, and fillets and you know all sorts of things. So this is sort of starting from scratch. And um, I'm sure you can gather that it's painful, but there are things you can do that you could never do with any other tool in ARCHICAD because it really is working with faces and points and, and things. Um, so, Rich, did you follow that? Uh, yes, I did. Thank you. Well, although I haven't paid 100% attention, I'll need to go back and look at the video. Um, yeah. I just sent you a file. Ignore, ignore the first email. And actually, what version uh, of ARCHICAD is it in? Is, is 27 okay? Yeah, 27 is fine. Yeah. Um, yep, yep. So, yeah, I'm going uh, to open, uh, so open up the uh, international version of 27 because you're down in Australia. Um, and then uh, it'll be thinking in terms of metric and and the ground floor being zero as opposed to one. Um, so I'm going to open that up. Hopefully I've got the latest version. I just, I know I just updated the US version here. I don't know if I did the international one. So we'll see if um, if it's compatible. Now your file, you sent that to me where? Uh, hang on, just just give me a second here because as as things always do, why can't I get that? Um, I just dropped it into my Dropbox like I did the first one, but of course the second one doesn't want to copy. I can't paste for some reason. Why is that? Why do these things happen when you're in a rush? Well, when you're when you put something into Dropbox and it is still uploading, then you may not have a link to yet to copy. Oh, that's that is 
possible. Okay. So let me have a look and see whether that's the seems to be there. Five two of two hundred and fifty-two megabytes. Okay. Uh -huh. Please. All right, so I actually have not updated the international version, um, so we'll see. Um, I did download that, and uh, I might as well. Um, uh, I've got it now. Here, I'll just send um, that. Oh. Are you, where did you, uh, put, you, you just sent I me a I did link. a Dropbox link. Is Dropbox. Where Dropbox. did you? Where did you send me the Dropbox link? It via email. Support. Support. Oh, okay. So let's go to um, okay. All right. So it's downloading here, um, and it downloaded very quickly. So let's just see if this can open it open the 274030 uh okay yeah it says it should be able to open it all right and meanwhile while i'm doing that i'm looking at other notes here um can you change the morph into an object? Ray Kelly says, yes, you can take anything that you draw in ArcGIS, either in 3D or 2D or combination, select it, and then go to the file menu, libraries and objects, and say save as object. Um, so you can do that, and that way you can, you know, and you can go back and forth. You can take an object or anything that you've drawn and say convert to morph, make some changes, then resave as an object. It won't be parametric anymore. It won't be scripted. It'll just be the geometry. But yes, so you can import things. That's a common thing is to bring things in from, let's say, a manufacturer or SketchUp 3D warehouse. They are maybe come in as objects or windows or doors, but they need they aren't perfect. So you can then say, turn that into a morph, tweak them, maybe change colors or things like that, and then resave as a new object. Now you have something that you can schedule. Oh, we have 18 of these chairs, something like that. Um, and uh, you know, each one looks the way you want it. Um, um, so Tatarano has yeah. a point about um, uh, if you model a big morph that goes multiple stories high, you can schedule the area on every story. So that's great if you really want to use the morph as a massing tool for a five story or a 50 story building you can have it change shape and um, as you go up and then essentially ArchiCAD can automatically cut through its storylines and give you areas and I think you can actually have the morph show up on each story with essentially its cross section um, there um, and Rick Pratt says morphs are like SketchUp you had no idea yeah they are that, that's the closest thing that I can think of SketchUp um, Ryan says, can you show the storylines for reference while you use the morph tool? Um, you can see storylines in, um, what do you call it, uh, in a section or, a, or an elevation. You could have some pseudo storylines if you wanted to just do some cutting planes or some zero thickness planes at the storylines if you were in 3D, so you can sort of, sort of see that. Um, and as I said, I believe you can on the stories you can actually have it show with the, where the cutting is so we'll take a look at that um so what do we have here um so if you pan the, over to if pan to your left you know towards the left hand side of the screen so yeah okay now you can see that stair alongside the new garage yeah so if you there's a what I did was just put in a, a stair and then I used a raining tool if you want to look at the 3D of that. So the idea was well, to get before you, before you go on right now it's a little hard to read because we've got this graphic that would be probably the head height um, here. 
And so I'm going to say, um, uh, show all element or drafting here. So I'll say, ah, interesting. Okay. So what are you trying to do? do? Uh, I don't want to see the, um, uh, in the, uh, if I go to um, model view options and I go to stair options here right now, Oh no, it's not showing headroom. So I, I thought I was seeing the headroom. No, no, no. That's that's a roof over top of the stair, and that's a screen along the side. Meant, oh, that's yeah, the quick, okay. So this is right, a so. quick, dirty, and dirty way of trying to, you know, get something in the model to show to the client. So mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, you know, it's got a roof and it's got it's screened on the side with some sort of metal or you know, perforated. Um, to give some protection from from the weather, so yeah. that that whole the, the stair itself is just a steel stair, and then the, all the rest of it was done with the railing tool. Yeah. Okay. So, so did you have a question or something that you wanted to do differently or wondered about? Well, for instance, I, I don't like that because I don't like those angled, um, uh, you know, and the the posts that I've got the the, the silver post or whatever they're holding the railing up you know there's a bunch of things about that that like i said it was a quick and dirty solution so what i was going to do was then think about using the morph tool to in actual fact you know uh, make that roof and to make it follow a slightly different more vertical you can see how the the railing tool has has pushed the roof up off kilter as such so, okay, so just, saying, like the fact that this is on an angle instead of um exactly exactly now okay so this railing um is following the the slope of the stair and what what would be different about um about this it it seems that you always yeah, you always want it to be horizontal and on a yeah. slope uh, so maybe yes maybe that's right it's um i guess i guess maybe it still have a vertical member um and you would just have the screen cut to that angle mm -hmm. so instead of this screen having a, a joint here you'd have some sort of cut here and, and the screen would would sort of fill this in it, it wouldn't have an angle that's right that's right yeah. yeah okay um now so when we have a railing and you have this complex shape here all right so this railing okay so all of the railing elements what's so that was a complex i believe i used a complex uh obviously did i, I used a complex um uh profile to yeah. to then put that railing in um and like i said i don't necessarily expect you to solve this at the moment because that's what i'm planning to use the morph tool for uh thinking that i can do that with with a number of morphs or you know um I'm assuming. Right. Well, so so one question, you know, just for for just general thing, is a quick and dirty thing is I can select this, I can go to the design menu, I can say convert it to a morph. All right. So this is my copy. So if I right. yes yeah. thing up, I can either undo it or I can close the file and reopen it, whatever. I'll say convert selection to morph. So what what will happen is it will no longer be a railing. It will become a morph. And if you had some annotation dimensions pointing to it. Those dimensions would disappear because they won't be pointing at a railing anymore. I'll just say OK. So now, oh, well, we have something that looks a little bit weirder. You know, it still has the same general shape, but you can see it's got all these lines. Now, one of the things about the, the morph tool is that we can go and I can, again, switch to the sub selection mode and I can select. Um, can we? It looks like I should be able to. Well, I wonder why I'm not allow, not allowing me to select this here. Hmm. This is a morph, and the sub selection should be able to select that. Um, it's a part of group morph, multiple elements. Tab key, another one. No. Hmm. Okay. Normally, when you have a morph, um, you should be able to select these parts here. Let me just switch this back here. 
select this. Okay, that's the whole morph. Um, now, if I switch, um, so, so I'm trying to see. I wanted to be able to sort of select it and say remove lines. Um, yes. You don't want to hide the lines, but for some reason this is um, not working. Um, if I switch back to the other file where I was demonstrating some things, um, I could say, hey, um, uh let's see what would be an example um uh we're not seeing any extra lines here um but if i wanted to i could say let's not make this so visible so what, what i would do is select this line here and say that i want to hide it and so you can see now i'm not seeing that as an edge and i can actually still it now it's actually thinking of this as one folded combination thing because i've hidden that line. Now, if I um, uh, use the view under morph, um, let's see, design, modify morph, show hidden morph geometry, then we can then we can select this. You can see it's got a sort of funny little dotted look. And I say, well, actually, let's make it solid again. And when I do that, I, I can go in the morph thing and say I'd like to curve. Um, let's see, uh, modify segmentation, let's see, try, actually smooth and merge faces, well, let's just try curve and merge here. No, I didn't do it, okay. Let me um, go and select this face and that face and say that the intersection between them, I possibly want to um, uh, smooth and merge faces. And it says, how how much do I want? Let me just smooth the boundaries. This will probably be a little weird, but yeah, you can see it sort of made it curved. Now there are controls that you can use, um, and I'm not gonna attempt to fine tune this, but you can play around with um, this stuff. Now you can see these are all separate little planes, but if I turn off the, um, the hidden morph geometry, now it says this is just one sort of continuous shape here. Um, and you know, so there are things that you can do there. And you know, I, you know, I did hide that edge. So that's what I was expecting to do here was um, be able to select um, this edge here, part of the group morph. Wonder, it might have to do with, let's suspend groups. And then can I, yeah, okay, so I, it was because the things were grouped. Um, so if I select this here and um, then make this hidden, you can soft or hidden, and go to this one, um, hidden. Uh, so you can see I can then make these things hidden and, um, then I can potentially draw a new line um, for, so if I select, um, I don't know, there, I, I, I'm not real expert on this, but if I say I want to just draw a line on this from here to here, that line now and the, um, and the shape as a whole, let's see if I, uh, go back to this I select this whole thing and this line and unify them then they become part of the same um, the same morph and now um, I can potentially well there's the line if I wanted to I could I could turn this can into grab, grab the top corner and pull it across to the top right corner and pull it across to the top of the line um, so if I say that I want to um, move just this node, so now you can see there's a void there. Um, this is, I'm not sure what this is. Let me just delete it. Whoops, no, that's part of that. So let's see if I, um, if I do sub-selection, select this, delete it. Yeah, so now, 
you probably have two two faces. You probably have two sides. This has a thickness, right? All uh, right. Yeah. So anyway, you can do things like that. So that was I just deleted that, but I could say let's make this surface some other color. Um, you know, uh, let's just um, make it red or something like that. Um, so you can see that, or I can make it transparent. Um, you know, so you have airspace. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have a, an air air thing. If uh, I can interrupt for a minute, Eric, what what I was thinking of doing, you did a you showed how you could put a cap on top of a wall alongside a stair that you know that was, and what I was thinking of doing was making the roof like like you did that cap just by a, drawing a profile um, uh, and then and then converting that to a morph, and then the the, the tubing could be that well. Not so much the tubing, but certainly these side pieces could just be into well that whole whole side piece could be done as one one morph. Um, and I guess I would still have to work out whether or not it was angled or not. I'd have to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so in terms of creating something that caps off um, a, a shape, if, if, let me just go to another um, uh, simple context here. Um, so uh, I'll just draw um, a wall. All right. So if this wall was going along a staircase and we wanted just a, a, a sort of a rail top um, on there, then one way we can do that is we can create a, a roof, just a single plane roof um, here. And let's say that um, I'll, I'll say it's resting on this edge um resting on that edge um and let's see uh let's say it's going down on this slope and then take it on this edge to here let's see did i i'm going perpendicular i'm not sure i'm going to get this right in one go um let's just leave that alone there um, did I, okay, so what did I create? I created an arbitrary um, piece. You can see that it started at the full width, um, but the um, uh, but the shape of it, um, I, I narrowed, I didn't, I didn't quite get it. So let me actually do it on plan um, to do it because what I really want to do is say that um, the, uh, this is going to be, this wall, um, so this is uh, this is going to be solid element operations. This wall is going to be the target, and this shape here is going to be the operator. And we're going to subtract and everything above it, and execute. And you can see that it's just cut off the top part of this this wall. Now I, I sort of made it a triangular piece rather than square. Uh, square. So let me start that sort of in a better way if I go plan here and say um, uh, create a, a roof make this very uh, not not a whole big um, uh, roof thing we're just going to have it be um, not composite we'll have it be a simple shape um, and we'll just call it wood um, here so we'll say um, wood millwork, um, and it's going to be uh, how thick? We'll just say one inch um, here, and say it's going to rest here. Uh, we're going to do a rectangle. Rest here, go up this way, and drag this. Now, what I've just drawn will not be uh, aligned properly, but but we should see, if I select all the roofs, you can see that there's this thing down at the bottom that is a roof. And if I take this edge and say I want to change the inclination here, this is now um, a one inch thick piece. And this can be the operator, the wall can be the target, 
and I can execute here. So this is now a wall that's started out this high, but its top has been cut off by this piece of railing. And this railing, of course, I can make this wider if I wanted to, um, uh, you know, have it stick out a little bit, you know, have some relief, um, then I can do that. And of course, this the height of this, um, instead of starting at whatever that low point is, you know, I'd say it's starting at four feet um, here. Um, so this is now something that I can adjust on the fly. I can say, I want to take this um, slope down. And that's now a cap on top of a, a wall. Um, so that's using the roof tool. You could also use a beam tool you know, as a top thing and cut off the top of the wall that way. So is that what you were referring to? Well, you used it for us just like I had with stairs with landings. So you just drew a, um, a line drawing following the stair uh, profile, slope mm -hmm. of the stair profile, uh, and then created a, you know, like a, a thickness that you created there on, on your railing, on your capping. Mm -hmm. and, and then clicked and made that into a morph, mm -hmm. um, which you then which you then extruded out to the width you wanted and stuck that on top of the wall and um, and cut the wall and you've now got the capping with the staggered stair landing mm -hmm. flights etc. Yeah, so if we take um, I don't know if you have a what elevation um, this would be. So here here's our elevation. Um, is this straight on to your stair? Yes. Uh, yeah, it should be, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, let me just switch this back to normal. Uh, so, yeah, if I, if I drew right here in this view um, a uh, morph um, here, just as a series of lines, um, and Let's just say, take it along here, uh, and I'll just do a sort of a, an arbitrary um, shape like this. All right, so now this is a series of lines that I can um, do something in 3D with. So one of the things that um, I can do uh, is I can let's see. Um, I press down on this and say I want to, you know, um, can I can reposition points and I can draw new ones. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just drag a copy, um, you know, up, you know, um, point one. Whoops, you must be in centimeters. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> 50 mils. Um, whoops. Uh, drag a copy here. And OK, let's just say 100. OK, so now I have um, two copies here. And I'm going to go and uh, say I want to draw a new line that connects them um, here. And I'll draw another line that connects these. And now all four of these, I think if I select, actually, I guess um, this this is now the bottom one has the thing going up, and this is the original copy, and I'm going to unify them. So when I um, go to the morph and say union, this is now one um, see, this is now one morph. You see, select that, and this I can then make. Um, uh, I can make solid. Um, so is this in terms of why are we seeing through it? Well, let's just take a look in 3D at what we have because I'm not sure where um, where this exists in 3D. So we do have a marquee here. There is that um, shape that I just drew. Okay. So this this morph shape that I drew that is lined up carefully, you know, in line with the stair, 
um, I can then extrude. Um, I think we have to go to design, modify morph and cover with faces. So now you can see it's got a thickness um, and then I can use the push pull and create something that, you know, is, you know, so, and then I can push, you know, make this narrower. And so anyway, we can, we can change this shape and make it as uh, be the appropriate depth um, here. And then this can be used to cut off the top of walls or, or things like that. Um, and if I were to drag it up, you know, you know, it can be whatever is the appropriate height above the stair. Is that, is that what you yes. were talking about? Yeah, so that, that could be used for the roof. It could be used for those side panels, like a separate one for the side panels. Yeah. Um, um, and I could even probably drag a point down to connect, because at the moment, of course, that's floating that top group yeah. of, of see-through panels where it really probably would be supported on the railing or, you know, some other method of suspending it. Um, yeah. But so you, that, that's, you, that's hear, you hear this is the element that I just drew, and now we're seeing it in the 3D, um, you know, parallel to these steps. Um, and, you know, I just drew it arbitrarily in another angle. And so I just basically just did a quick recap. I used the 2D geometry um, here, just drew with the, the morph tool, whatever shape, you know, just like you're drafting, um, and drew a series of lines. I can always extend it. I added you know, points going up. And then I, I took the original series of three lines and just dragged a copy of it up. And then I unified them so that they were basically one element, one morph. And then I used the command to cover it with faces. So then it became, you know, uh, like a paper uh, rather than just a wire. Um, and then I extruded that paper to make, you know, some 3D volume. And of course, I, I could move it up or down and and do other things. So that's the way that we work with 2D stuff and create something 3D in relationship to it. Um, in the in your other example on your video, which I'd recommend people look at because there's a couple few other ones, <laughs> that, good tips. Um, but you, I'm trying to think of what you did. But what you, you can notice in that you've got an unequal uh, depth to the sloping and the flat section. Uh, you use the um, uh, the pet palette tool, which allows you to stretch something and everything because remains equidistant. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm trying to yeah, think that's of what I was trying to figure out, and I didn't have it there. So there, there is um, uh, when you when you have something. Let's say let's go to just a pure uh, um, 2D document. Let's see, if we go um, here. So I go to polyline. So if if I um, Uh, so if I have this shape here, um, now if I go to this, there is this option here. We were not seeing it with the morph. Right, yes. Okay. Um, so if I choose that, then you can see it's moving it and it's maintaining, you know, a constant distance, um, uh, which is, you know, important. So in order to do this with the morph tool, what, what I would do is um, I might um, uh, I think copy you, this. You did the line work and then you converted that to a morph. That's right, yeah. So I might copy that line work. So I've just done Command C, then go and say, I wanna offset this by, you know, um, 100 or something like that um, there, then paste back in in the original location, the line work. So you can see this is the this is a copy of the original one. This is the offset one that maintained the uniform thing. But those are just lines. And then if I drew uh, this and let's say that um, and add a line. Now right now this is going perpendicular um, rather than vertical, but whatever. Uh, at, at this point, this is two polylines. I can go and use the edit, reshape, um, unify. And now this is one polyline. 
Now that's still just purely 2D, but now I can easily go to the morph tool um, here and use the magic wand and trace it. So now that's a morph here. So yeah, if you wanna have a precise geometry, which of course you would, then some features are not available in the morph tool. I can't go to the edge of this morph. Well, actually it looks like this one, I can, I can make the morph. Mm -hmm. But it all it didn't seem to be available when I just had um, so if I had just the morph like this whoops um, and then you can see that there's no that that option it wasn't there that's what, what I was did, looking. What did you do a uh, command? I mean a, a copy drag a copy with that. No, that one. That's a drag a copy. Well, that's yeah. what I did. I did drag the copy, and of course, it made the 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 width of this, um, you know, the, the thing. You do not, the drag. Is there not the option then on the pet palette? I can drag the whole thing, but that's that's just uh, that's just moving, uh, displacing it. It's not. No, no, but did, awesome. did you put in the drag a copy command first? Whoops. I don't know why this is um, not visible here, but if I say move, drag a copy, you know, I can do that. Um, oh, I see. It doesn't, doesn't, yeah, no, it doesn't give you an option. Yeah. But it, but it, this distance here is not the same as that distance there. No, no. Um, so it just doesn't have that offset edge. Um, at least it didn't appear that. Um, if I go to the edge here, yeah, we, you know. Yeah, the controls are more limited. However, this being a morph, now it does seem to have that because it's a continuous shape, you know, or it's it's a closed shape. So for some reason, the morph only has that available if it's a closed shape as opposed to an open shape. Um, so that's a couple extra steps. So we are at the two hour mark. We did some, I think, interesting things. Um, so Todd Toronto had some things, um, and Todd Toronto, let me open up your line here. Um, so let's just take a look at your thing of multiple stories um, for for more. So Todd Toronto, your line is open if you are um, there. Um, so if I take, the, let's Hello. see. Hi. Um, so I'm going to take the morph tool. I'm going to go and just say create. Um, uh, bigger volume um, let's see let's take this up so this is a you know multiple stories right okay now if I go to the first floor we're gonna see here's this shape right yep now, um, let me go into 3d and change the shape just the very simplest um, suggestion of a uh, of massing I'll just select this um, go to uh, morph tool go go to sub select here select this and um say so i want to do drag and yeah. okay so now this is um something that i guess is vertical on this side and it's slanted there so it's getting narrower let me make it a little bit more dramatic i'll just drag it um in a little bit more Okay, so now um, if I go to the plan, you can see here's the top line of that. If I go to the, um, where would it be? Uh, okay, we don't have floor plan and section morph selection settings. So we don't have that there. Uh, you need to change the selection tool. I think you... Oh, okay. if I go to... Um, uh, if I go back to here and select the morph as a whole, there's floor plan and section. So I can say um, show on stories, let's just say all stories. And then floor plan display is going to be cut only, uh, maybe. Um, and the show projection, um, you know, to floor plan range there. Um, so now if I go up to the second floor and the third floor, you can see how this got narrower so each one of these as i click on it this is what we're seeing um 
based on uh, with a cutting plane of you know the what would be the fourth um, floor. So if I do this more dramatically, um, you know again, um, so take this here and drag this more there. Now when I go to the plan, you can see how it's gotten narrower. Now I can change this um, uh, to here and say, what do I want to see? I want to see not just the cut, but the uh, projected here. So that's that's the part that's within the story um, section, I guess. Um, and, but here's where it goes to. So this is this is what's on that story. So anyway, there are variations like that, but this you can schedule it um, as well. Um, so is that is there anything I'm missing here other than the fact that it's a very simplistic shape? Uh, no, no, no. This is it. Uh, we can use it for massing, for to make a quick model and to schedule the areas. If you want to see how many square meters you have on every floor. Right, right. Yeah. So um, I don't know. In terms of uh, schedule, if we go just uh, so this will be the last thing we look at today. If we go to schedules. And I just, I don't think there's a be a, um, well, here's square footage. Let's see that. Um, so here's interesting. So it's a square footage of what the heck are we measuring um, area um, there. I don't know. Um, element type is morph area, volume by story. But why is it um, uniform? Because clearly it's getting smaller. Oh, but here's the volume. The volume in each story yeah. is changing. The area, for some reason, is staying constant based on the ground. So uh, I think you have more than one morph on your model, maybe. Uh, no, I had a few morphs. These these lower ones, but this one is just showing the same number on every story as an area. So it's not showing the cut through story. Um, so it might be there might be a add a field. Um, uh, let's see, if I just click add field and under morph, area by story. So this just says area. Here's area by story. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So here, area by story. So now here, yeah, here each story is getting smaller yeah. as we go up um, here. The, the base area doesn't change, but, you know, this is showing the, the area on that floor plate. And I, I'm not quite sure whether it's at the base of the floor or at the cutting plane, um, but uh, I think it's at the floor level. At the floor level, okay, yeah. yeah. All right. So obviously that, you know, could get quite sophisticated as you change shapes and make it more intricate, and it could help as you're defining, you know, relatively quickly a design and saying, yeah, this is going to have about the right amount of area for rental or for use. So, all right. Um, well, uh, it's been fun. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Um, Tataranu, Rich, uh, R Ryan, um, Rick, uh, I don't know who else we had who asked questions. Um, so uh, there was, uh, oh, so Ray asked, can you change a morph into an object? Is Ray still on here? Um, yeah, he is. So if we look at this um, uh, shape here, so not that this is particularly interesting, but if I um, select this, I can go to the file menu, libraries and objects, and I can say that I'd like to save selection as an object um, here, and it'll take the top view in this case, and that'll be an object here. And so um, if I now go to the object tool um, here and click. You can see that is an object, whereas this is a morph, okay? And similarly, I can take any object, you know, let's just take a, a chair, um, all right, so let's take this intricate Bistro chair, 
place that there. Okay, so that chair, I can select that and I can say I want to convert it into a morph. And it looks much the same, but now I can select individual pieces and say I don't want that piece. I can change the colors. You know, it's hard to manipulate, you know, these tubular elements. You know, you can't like make them thicker or or do some other shapes very easily, but you can do some add on some things or remove some things, um, you know, in a relatively straightforward way. Um, I would like to add uh, one more thing. Uh, the morph tool is the only tool that you can use to draw lines in 3D. Yep. Yeah, that's that's what I was um, doing here, although I wasn't demonstrating a good use case. But this is, these are morphs that are, you know, it's just a line. And you can draw a line on the face of a building. You can draw a line on, you know, any um, uh, any components. So if you do want lines not just to show up in an elevation but to show up in the 3d view that's something is that what you were referring to that type of thing yeah okay all right um so ray hopefully that gives you a couple of insights oh and yasek nice to see you on on the call um all right so we'll finish up thanks for joining me for this you know, adventure into the nooks and crannies of Archicad. Um, next month, we'll have, I'm planning to have Tom Simmons of ArchVista present Modelport. Uh, some of you may know of Modelport or, or own it. Um, it's a relatively inexpensive add-on for Archicad that allows you to import objects from many different formats, including, I think, Revit stuff. And, um, in addition to just being able to sort of uh, save the import and some of the formats are things that ArcCAD doesn't digest easily. Um, it does allow you to uh, do some control of geometry. Like if you want to simplify something that has a lot of complex curves, you can make it somewhat less detailed, still look pretty clean. Um, so therefore it's not as heavy. Um, and uh, I don't know, it, it allows you to manipulate imported objects um, in ways that you couldn't do in a straightforward way with ARCHICAD itself. So it's called Modelport, and we'll have Tom demonstrate that. Tom is the uh, head of Arch Vista, which is the reseller in the Oakland, uh, California area, the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. Um, I've known him for 30 years, uh, close to 30 years. So um, they, uh, um, you know, developed that. Uh, they've had model port for a number of years and, and I think it's a pretty cool tool. So we'll take a look at what you can do with model port next time. So uh, thanks for joining me. Please uh, reach out to me by email if you wish to talk to me, support at bobro.com. And if you like the coaching that I did today, and you want to get more of it, you can join my coaching program at archicadtraining.com slash coaching. So archicadtraining.com slash coaching, and you'll see um, some options for monthly, quarterly, or annual membership. And every week, I answer questions. Um, here in the Archicad user, I just do it once every few months. So take care, be well. Bye bye. See you later. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You're Thanks, welcome. sir. You're welcome.